good to see you all here. It's good to be here. And uh, I don't know about you, but we did a little four wheeling on our way in this morning. <laughs> Well, the car, the car was clean. It really was. You never the abortion car before Sunday Right. After or something. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. I'll try to keep that up here filed, filed away. So, all right. Well, it's good to be here in fellowship together with you all. Uh, I needed to... Just double check. Did we have any birthdays this week? exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy, worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Shall we sing His name is wonderful, number 174. No harm done. 
before we um, share joys and concerns, um, I would like to invite Bill and Jim up. And if you would turn in your hymnals, uh, the rest of the congregation, to number, it's page 38. We have a special treat today. Bill had asked me a few weeks ago if, about, um, just come on up here if you wouldn't mind. Bill had asked me a few weeks ago if, if I could make contact with the Lutheran Church in Great Bend that he's been a member of and to switch his uh, membership to here because of it's so far to drive anymore and, and so and Jim this morning said that he'd like to join the church too. So we're going to um, just go through the process here. Um, uh, so I will just read the light print, and then when we get down to verse or to number 16 down there on page 38, then we'll have you join in. Okay. As members of Christ Universal Church, you will be loyal to. Will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? Okay. As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. Read with me. We give thanks for all that God has offered you and you, and, and we welcome you, love you, you in Christian love as members, members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Welcome. Praise the Lord. Okay. Other than that particular joy, do we have any other joys and concerns that we can list in our prayer time this morning? Father in heaven, we do thank you for Jim and Bill, and we ask, Lord, that you would bless them as they have committed themselves to this body. And, uh, um, Father, we, just, we thank you for good friends and, and long relationships that we long-term relationships that we've had as a congregation with them, but but officially today we have made it so. And uh, so we just ask that you bless that. Two, Father, um, we want to lift up all our brothers and sisters who are traveling today. Lord, return them home safely uh, as they uh, have their last uh, uh, hurrah for the summer, the last vacation. We just uh, ask that you would give them rest and relaxation. 
taxation, but return them to us safely. Thank you for that. We also thank you, Lord, that you brought Mary back home to us. We pray for the situation uh, with her son, that, uh, that he would have his needs met according to you or his riches in Christ. Father, too, we just want to, this morning as we worship you, we, we, uh, we just thank you that we have this, this building that we can worship in. We have these people we can worship with. We, we praise you with our psalms. We, we praise you with the reading of scripture. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the, the blessings that we have received by, by giving of our tithes and our offerings. And we, we also commit our, ourselves once again to your service. We, uh, we ask, Lord, your blessing on our time here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, please turn in your hymnals once again to number 462. It's a sweet thing to be able to trust in Jesus, is it not? Version. 
Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On Him, God the Father has placed His seal of approval. When they asked Him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one He has sent. So, they asked Him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is, is it, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. There is, there are, there is a lot of talk this, these days about certain fast food restaurants that put such huge amounts of preservatives in their food that you can leave their hamburger and fries out on the table for years and it will never grow moldy or break down into mush. Not that it's edible years later or even when it's fresh, but it certainly looks that way. Now in our scripture text this morning, Jesus is talking to the crowds about food that lasts, specifically bread that lasts, but not in the way that I've just described with the fast food. Jesus voluntarily enters this humble state in human flesh, come down from heaven as the bread of life. He presents himself as one who alone is able to supply every need. And in our passage today, he comes to specifically satisfy the hunger of everyone on earth permanently. What kind of hunger? Well, we'll get to that. The people ask Jesus a question in verse 28. And notice that I'm jumping right into verse 28, uh, skipping a few verses because we just don't have enough time to deal with all of the depth of everything that's in this passage. I, I, I encourage you to take some time this week to, to look at the entire passage and, and study on your own. But the people ask Jesus a question in verse 28, and he says, what must we do to do the works that God requires, they say to Jesus. It is a question asked by people who are intrigued, but not yet entered the, the lightened path of um, eternal life. Now maybe they think they are on the wrong road. They imagine something must be required of them, a rite of initiation perhaps, per, performed in order to be accepted into this club, they expect that they must do some kind of works, but what kind, they do not know. And so we, can, we characterize their condition as self-righteousness in the flesh. They are operating completely outside the balance of spiritual reality, unaware of anything other than their own little world. Within this fleshly channel of thought, the mind is puffed up when it perceives that it can do something good for God. For whenever such people do something, they consider themselves entitled to some reward from God. 
Well, God, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. You know, and so forth. Or I'll do this for you, and then you can do this for me if you promise, if you promise to do this. You know, they kind of do these bargaining things. So when they do something good, they expect something good in return from God. They imagine that they are worthy of, uh, of even eternal life because they have somehow earned it. Okay? So the greatness of this error must be brought to the front and center in this passage because this is the perspective, perspective of these people who are chasing Jesus around the countryside. So we're going to examine this for a second. When, when the people believe that they can earn salvation by their works, they assume that, that God uh, owes them salvation because of the good things that they have done. Such a reward cannot be characterized as grace, then, but rather a payoff on a debt. See, when we, when we think that we've earned God's salvation, we, we reduce our sweet Savior to the level of a debtor. Our unbelief and pride actually humiliates Almighty God, robbing Him of His glory. What must we do? Here's the question they ask again. What must we do to do the works that God requires? Just a moment before, Jesus has instructed them in verse 27. Do not work for food that uh, spoils. Do not work for food that spoils. Um, lost my place. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. But the mind of the flesh, which is an opponent of God, it said, the mind of the flesh is at enmity with God, is unable to embrace the concept that salvation is a gift. To explain it another way, the heart is unwilling to admit to terms of moral bankruptcy, and receive full pardon at absolutely no cost. Clean slate. Completely unearned. The sinner wants to do something to earn it. The woman at the well did not know the gift of God until the work of grace was completed in her. The rich young ruler cried out, Good teacher, what must I do to be saved? On the day of Pentecost, the Jews exclaimed, Brothers, what shall we do? The Philippian jailers asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? It was the same with the prodigal son who imagined to himself, If I was to just go back home and work for my father for a wage, at least maybe I could earn his respect again. same everywhere with all people. Now the Lord Jesus answers displaying great patience and grace and he says the work of God is this to believe in the one he has sent. While he describes it as a work though technically not an act of works according to the law or bringing an offering or something like that. Rather Jesus sets forth the single requirement faith a requirement to believe in the agent of grace that God provided. Christ the Savior is appointed by God, and faith in Him is what God accepts. Without this faith, nothing else is acceptable. And so then, answer me one question, Pastor. Is it in any way possible for me to enter eternal life without good works? Great question. I'm glad you asked. The answer is no. You cannot enter heaven without good moral, good moral character. There, it just doesn't happen. So just make sure that the works that you submit to the Lord as evidence, as a means to purchase your salvation, that these works are completely without flaw or error. Wait a second. Yes, your works must be holy, as holy as your God is. Or else you can never stand before Him uncondemned. 
You can never enter his presence without it. Well, bummer. <laughs> that doesn't work for me because my works are flawed. I know it. So how in the world can I obtain that kind of character? It's impossible, yes. No, it isn't impossible. How? Great question. Glad you asked. By purifying, by purifying myself until I become completely holy. No, that doesn't work either, because that's works again. You can't do anything, only by faith. See, Christ Jesus has already done the perfect works, without fault. Okay. And so, it is our faith in His work that applies His righteousness to our lives. Therefore, our character is completely holy, completely morally acceptable. cannot do this, though, until we are able to admit that all our efforts fall short, all our doings are faulty, even our righteousness is stained by pride if we think it is anything but soiled rags. Here lies the greatest problem of all. We cannot abandon our own works and accept the works of another unless we have first accepted the fact that our own works are faulty and worthless. It is impossible. We cannot do this ourselves. It takes a work of God, the conviction of the Holy Spirit that alone can motivate a sinner to renounce his own works and take hold of the salvation only Christ gives. Without faith, all you have is works. Their flaw. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So I ask, are you still trusting your own works for salvation? Even if they were what you wish them to be, they could never save you. Your prayers, your tears, your sorrow over sin, your service to the church and to others, your financial gift, your, your church attendance, None of these things, even if they were perfect, would be able to save you. Why? Because no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. This is Romans 3.20. Rather, through the law, we become only conscious of sin. That's what the law was, re was there for, was to show us that we had fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 The wages of sin is death. Salvation is not something to be earned by keeping a religious code. It is a free gift received by faith. We do not serve in order to be saved. We are saved in order to serve. And this life of service is motivated and led and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God who lives within us and our works therefore serve as evidence, as positive evidence that we are in fact saved. I'd like to invite you this morning to consider this. In light of these things that we finally look to the cross and we see it as something other than foolishness. That on that cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin, says the old hymn. The entire weight of the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus, who bore our sins, took the punishment we deserve, and only faith in him, in his work on the cross, can save. God sent and approved of no other agent by raising them from the dead, he is the true bread from heaven, Jesus is. Consuming Him is a spiritual endeavor. The bread is the living Word of God. He is the bread that lasts. Yes.
know, I, I have a different one, uh, which is interesting. It's just disappeared on me. So we are going to enter, with these things in mind, we are going to enter in our, into our time of, of communion. And would you follow with me in this time in the insert here? Christ our Lord invites to this table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you in our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Free us for joyful obedience through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 Lord God of all power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you give birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread and gave thanks to you, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you, for, the, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Father, now we offer our bodies to you as we come before the altar of the Almighty we come to remember to remember the work of God in creating the world with the voice of our Savior we have the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, giving us clarity in the, in the study of the scriptures to, to convict us of sin, to inspire us to serve, 
to empower us to give of ourselves. Lord, we remember the cross. How beautiful this cross. The stain with blood. The suffering represented there. As Christ bore our sins and our shame. Even the wounds that we have, He bore. To make all things right. He endured the entirety of the wrath of God on our behalf. That's what this table represents to us. By His stripes, we are healed. Now, Father, the, the elements here, having been duly consecrated, We receive them as special gifts from you to us, not just to remind you, or to remind us of you, but also to fill us once again with this lasting food. We give you praise in all these things. confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. eat. Do this in remembrance of me.
this cup represents the blood of the new covenant. Drink it in remembrance of me. for the offering.
forth in peace the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.